there's a lot of deep things in the Torah portion of Behelotecha. Things that you just don't really have time to cover in one sitting of a drosh on the Torah portion, or even a week-long study, Sidra by Sidra, Aliyah by Aliyah, regarding the Torah portion. So sometimes we have to kind of backtrack and uh, just kind of take our time and point out some very special and unique secrets, very special and unique things about the Torah portion of Behelotecha. So first of all, I want to go to Numbers chapter 11, verses 11 through 17, and let's just kind of Hash this out, if you will. So Moses asked Adonai, Oh, why have you brought trouble on your servant? Haven't I found favor in your eyes? What's wrong? What's the deal? Why is Moses crying and bellyaching? Because the people are sick of the manna. They want meat. They're, they're getting ready to, to uh, lynch Moses, if you will. And so, you know, he's, he's basically hanging by a thread and he's at the end of his rope. And he says, why have you brought trouble on your servant? Haven't I found favor in your eyes that you laid the burden of these people on me? Did I conceive all these people or did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom just as, uh, just as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised to their fathers? Oh, where can I get meat for all these people? For they wailed to me saying, give us meat to eat. I'm not able to carry these people by myself. The load is too heavy for me. Um, isn't that what your father-in-law Jethro said? When you were sitting from sun up to sun down judging the people, hey, appoint leaders. You know, so so one set of leaders were appointed, uh, and they were judges, but they also needed another set of, of leaders for another task. So verse 15 says, uh, Moses is like, if this is how you're treating me, kill me now. If I have found favor in your eyes, kill me, please. Don't let me see my own misery. I'd rather die by your hand, God, than by the hand of this people. So, now it's interesting. Um, we've all heard it said, ask and you shall receive. We think that because we're asking God, we have to ask nice. But we see here in this passage I just read that Moses was at the end of his rope. He was frustrated, and he cried out to God for help to lead this people in the form of a complaint. Did God get wrathful and thundery and angry and turn Moses away? No. God sympathized and gave help uh, to Moses, the help that he required, as we'll soon read and as we'll soon see. Some people think that because God is holy, God is above us, that we shouldn't come to him in a, in, a, in a sad, angry way of complaint. Have you read the prophets recently? I mean, that's all Habakkuk did was, was bellyache and complain to God. That's what Job did, bellyache and complain to God. That's what a lot of the other prophets did, was bellyache and complain to God. God has big shoulders. He can take it. He knows that we don't see the whole picture. He's patient with us. So therefore, he understands. So don't be afraid to go to God if you're upset. So it says in verse 16 of chapter 11 of Numbers, Adonai said to Moses, How dare you come to me in such an ungodly, unholy manner, complaining and bellyaching to me? What, you faithless or something? No, that's not what he said. He says, here's the solution. Get up off your duff. Here's the solution. Bring me 70 of the elders of Israel whom you know to be elders of the people and their leaders. Take them to the tent of meeting so that they may stand with you there. Then I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take some of the spirit, some of the ruach, some of the anointing, in other words, that is on you and place it on them. They will carry with you the burden of the people. Uh, so you will not be carrying it alone. So you had one set of elders that was more of a judicial kind of thing, uh, and you had another set of elders kind of keeping things in order, if you will, kind of, you know, being the police and the ambassadors and calming things down. Uh, as At least that's the way some rabbis uh, uh, say and think and interpret that. So, uh, you know, I, I think that it's interesting that Moses complains and God answers. Moses complains, and it's almost as if God rewards him for complaining. Hey, I'm glad you had the guts to bring this to me. You know, I know you're upset. I know you're angry and you're, you're only human. Therefore, you know, I understand, you know, the outburst of emotion here. But, uh, hey, calm down, Moses. I got things under wraps. I got things in hand. All you have to do is just pick 70 elders to be with you. And, and, and the spirit that I gave you, the anointing that I gave you, the wisdom that I gave you, I'm going to give to them too. 
and it's described as Moses being a candle and lighting 70 other candles. And when, you, when a candle lights another candle, the light of the original candle where the source of fire comes from is not diminished. Therefore, Moses wasn't diminished in power, but yet at the same time, more actually, he's able to share the power that he had that God gave him. All right, so that's the first thing that I wanted to cover. The second thing I wanted to cover uh, was about this anointing, about this Holy Spirit that was upon Moses and upon the 70 elders. So for that, we're going to go to um, Numbers chapter 11, verse 24 through 30. It says, so Moses went out and told the people Adonai's words. He gathered 70 of the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent, tabernacle in other words. Adonai descended in a cloud and spoke with him. He took some of the Ruach, some of the spirit that was on him, and placed it on each of the 70 elders. Uh, it so happened that when the spirit, the Ruach, first rested on them, they prophesied, but never again. Two men, however, had remained in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. Okay, why weren't they among the 70? Because, uh, you know, there were so many that were chosen for the elders. But God only required 70, so there was two too many because there was like a pair or such from each tribe or something of that nature. And uh, so by lot, they had to decide, okay, who are we going to cut from the team? So these guys were cut from the team. But nonetheless, God still considered them leaders. And it says that the Ruach rested upon them within the camp, and they were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tent. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man run to Moses and said, Help, Dad and me, Dad, are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, since his youth, cried out and said, Mose, uh, Moses, my Lord, stop them. It's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, if people aren't a part of our particular denomination or group and they minister or say something, we get a little intimidated that they're going to steal our thunder or kind of muscle in on our side of the street. Or we get a little jealous or fearful that they may become more popular than we are. But uh, that wasn't Moses' concern, and that wasn't even Yeshua the Messiah's concern. Because remember the time in the passage of Scripture where it talks about the disciples saying, Hey, Jesus, guess what? We saw this guy. We don't know who he is, but we saw this guy teaching and preaching in your name. And hey, because he wasn't a part of us, we told him to stop. We nipped that right in the bud. And Yeshua's like, why did you do that? That's not necessary. You know, it, don't, don't be intimidated or fearful by, because of this guy. He's for us, not against us. You know, so he may not be traveling with our group and our circle, but he's on our team. And so the, Moses was basically saying the same thing. But Moses said to them, are you jealous on my behalf? If only Adonai would make all his people prophets. A true leader is not intimidated by somebody else in the spotlight. He actually wants somebody else in the spotlight. He wants people to outgrow him and to become better than he is so that they'll be better teachers and leaders than he is. Are you jealous on my behalf? If only Adonai would make all his people prophets. If only Adonai would put the spirit on all of them. And guess what? That is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. Uh, a, a, a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, I believe it is, that I'll put all my flesh or I'll put my spirit upon all flesh. On your sons and daughters will dream dreams and prophesy and all this kind of jazz. But Moses said to them, are you jealous on my behalf? If only. Adonai would make all his people prophets. If only Adonai would put his spirit on all of them. And he did in Acts chapter 2. But we'll see again, he did in another instance that kind of parallels this. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Okay, so there's 70 elders of Israel, right? But we know that there are 12 disciples. But did you know that there were more than 12? That there were actually 70 disciples in one instance? Go with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, and it talks about Yeshua sending out the 70, sending out the 70 disciples. So it says, now after these things, the Lord assigned 70 others and sent them out uh, by twos before him into the town and place where he himself was about to go. And he was telling them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beg the Lord of the harvest to send out workers 
into the harvest field. Go forth, look, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. Do not be burdened with a money belt or a travel bag or shoes, and do not greet anyone along the way. Whatever home you enter, first say, Shalom, be on this home. And if a son of Shalom, a son of peace, is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same home, eating and drinking there, uh, the things that they offer, for the worker is deserving of his wages. Do not keep moving on from house to house. Whatever town you enter, and they come, uh, and they welcome you, eat what is set before you. Then, here, here, here's the kicker here, then heal the sick of that town, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Wait a second, how are they going to heal the sick? Up to this point, it was only Yeshua that was doing the healing. What did he do? Yeshua put the spirit that was upon him, upon these 70 disciples. He put it on the 12 disciples, and it says the 12 disciples came back and said, Hey, you won't believe what happened, Yeshua. This is great. The sick were healed, the dead were raised, and the demons obeyed our voice. They were excited. And so here he says, verse 9, Then heal the sick of that town. In other words, the Spirit's on me, I'm going to put on the 70, just like what we read in Numbers chapter 11. And let's jump down to verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Master, even the demons submit to us in your name. And why? Because they had Yeshua's Spirit upon him. Just like the 70 elders had the anointing and the Spirit of Moses upon them, the 70 disciples had the, the Spirit of Yeshua upon them. So I, I just think that's a really interesting uh, a parallel there. Uh, something that I wanted to relate to to bridge the Torah to the renewed covenant. All right, so now the next thing that I want to tackle uh, in, in, in uh, Behelotecha, things that maybe we haven't tackled in other things, is chapter 12. In chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, basically behind his back, on the count of the Cushite woman he married. Because he had married a Cushite woman. Okay, let, let, let's, let's pump the brakes here. I thought he married a Midianite woman. Uh, did he not marry Zipporah, which was from Midian? Because he was with, with, with Jethro, the priest of Midian, and Zipporah was his daughter. So what's this whole Cushite business? Does the Bible contradict itself? Is there a mistake here? No, there's just something that has been left out. Uh, you know, there are some other extra biblical texts and passages that have not been included in the Bible because they were not inspired, but they were not canon. Doesn't mean they weren't true, just the Lord didn't feel it necessary to make it a part of the canonical scriptures, though it is history, though it is held in high esteem by, by the first century believers as well as the Jewish community. Things such as the books of Enoch, the book of Jasher, the book of Jubilees. So if we read in Jasher, chapters 72 through 76, we'll see that Moses didn't go straight to Midian after he left as a fugitive from Egypt because of killing the Egyptian taskmaster. It says in Jasher that he first went to Cush and became a general in the Cushite army. And if you make yourself a part of another people, it was traditional in ancient times that to become a full-fledged member of this people, that you were given a spouse so that you could be married and, and, and be one with this people. So this is how Solomon made alliances with all the other nations around him, uh, you know, and uh, so this this is the same thing that happened with Joseph. When he was in Egypt, he, he was made a viceroy, second in command of Egypt, and because of this, he was given a wife, and he birthed Ephraim and Manasseh through this Egyptian woman. So here we see that Moses actually had more than one wife, which wasn't really unusual. There was a lot of the patriarchs who had more than one wife, and it was culturally accepted uh, in that day, and their culture was set up to handle something like that. So it says, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses on account of the Cushite woman he married, because he had married a Cushite woman. Uh, okay, so I believe my personal opinion is because Cush was ancient Ethiopia, and Ethiopia was a larger territory in ancient times than it is today as a smaller state in Africa. Uh, this Cushite woman was probably a, a wife he was given when he became general of the Cushite army, according to Jasher, chapters 72 through 76. So Zipporah was his second wife because she was a Midianite. Now, some rabbinic sources try to say that, no, 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 this Cushite was really Zipporah because Cush is just a way of saying black and beautiful. It's a poetic 
form of addressing who Zipporah was, uh, but I kind of personally think that's a stretch. They also say that Cushite is uh, is is a beautiful black, like an onyx stone, like a jewel, but also Kush or Kushite is a shortened version of the Arabian tribe Kus, which is said to have been the tribe that Jethro uh, and Zipporah were from. They were from the nation of Midian, but the smaller clan or tribe was Kus, and it was just made Kush in the Bible. Uh, personally, I don't hold to that. I think that's kind of a stretch, but it's not a major doctrinal point or a salvation issue. So whatever you believe on that doesn't matter to me. I'm just giving you what I see uh, as the bigger picture when you pull back and take into consideration the extra biblical texts, especially the book of Jasher. Okay, now coming to the part where a lot of you probably tuned in and wanted to listen because of the, you know, tantalizing title, Were There Two Arks? We know there's an Ark of the Covenant. Were there two Arks of the Covenant? Some rabbis say, yes, they were. You know, some, and personally, I'm not sure exactly how I feel on this, but I just kind of wanted to point this out to you, that there is this theory that there were two Arks of the Covenant. And so we go to Numbers chapter 10, verse 11 through 21. It says, on the 20th day of the second month in the second year, the cloud lifted up from above the tabernacle of the testimony. Then B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, set out on their travels in the Sinai wilderness. The cloud came to rest in the wilderness of Paran. So they set out for the first time by the mouth of Adonai by Moses' hand. So it says in verse 14 that the first division to go out, the first ones to break camp and leave and to lead the charge, if you will. It says, verse 14, the standard of the camp of the sons of Judah set out first by their divisions. Over them was Nachshon, son of Amminadab, and over the division of the tribe of the sons of Issachar was Nathaniel, son of uh, Zuar, and over the division of the tribe of Zebulun was Eliab, son of Hilion. Then it says, verse 17, then the tabernacle was dismantled or disassembled, and the sons of Gershon and Merari were carrying it. They put it on the, uh, the ox carts that were donated by Israel, and they set out. And it says, the camp standard of, of Reuben set out by their divisions. Uh, over his division was Eleazar, son of Shadur, uh, uh, Shel Shelumiel, son of uh, Zerushadai, was over the division of the tribe of Simeon, and over the tribe of uh, Gad was Eliasaph of Duel. Then verse 21 says, Then the Kohathites set out carrying the holy items, meaning the Ark of the Covenant, and all the other furnishings. The tabernacle was erected before their arrival. So the tent was set up, and by the time the furnishings got there, they could just move right in. So here, it would just seem that the ark traveled behind, uh, several of the uh, behind several of the tribes in order to protect it. But yet here we read in verse 33 through 36, seems like a contradiction. It says, so they advanced, so they advanced, from the mountain of Adonai, a trip of three days, the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai going ahead of them for those three days to seek out a resting place for them. The cloud of Adonai was over them by day when they advanced from the camp. Whenever the Ark would set out, Moses would say, Arise, Adonai, and may your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee before you. Then whenever it came to rest, he would say, return Adonai to the myriad of the uh, to the myriad thousands of Israel. So here uh, it just kind of seems like there's a contradiction. OK, did the ark travel with the rest of the furnishings uh, behind several of the tribes or did it go to the camp? Which one is it? OK, so. Here is one theory. One theory is that this was an exception to the rule. Normally, the ark would travel behind several of the tribes with, with the furnishings, but in this instance, because it was their first uh, journey really setting out, that um, this was a special occasion, so the ark kind of was to uh, inaugurate this journey, and it was to go out before them kind of like a spy or kind of like a harbinger or, or an omen or a warning to the other nations. This represents our God. You know how powerful our God is. He defeated the Egyptian pantheon. Stay away. So that's how some people take it, and this is likened into the passage in Joshua where they crossed the Jordan River in Joshua, and it says that the ark went 
before them, and as soon as the priest's feet touched the water, the Jordan parted, and the ark was set in the middle of uh, of the uh, of the Jordan River as all the other tribes passed by. So it was kind of an exception to the rule. That's what some people and some rabbis say. Others say that there was actually two arks. Why? Because the ark, number one, was the throne of God on earth. Yes, it was transportable. Yes, it was portable, but it stayed in one place. It stayed uh, in the tabernacle when the tabernacle was set up. It didn't move around. It only moved when you were transporting it from one tabernacle site to another. And so, you know, a regular throne stayed in the throne room, did it? does it not? So, you also have what's called a litter. A litter is a portable throne, and it's carried on poles. And whenever the king of a people would want to travel around and visit his people, a lot of times they had that portable throne called a litter that would be carried by many of his servants on their shoulder, and they would take him wherever he wanted to go. Well, this second ark, or supposed second ark, was, was kind of like a litter. It represented a litter. It represented a mobile throne instead of a stationary throne, like the one of the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be that was in the tabernacle. Also, it was kind of like a decoy or dummy ark. So whenever like a president or a king is traveling in a foreign country, there's usually two convoys. And one is the real convoy and the other is the dummy convoy. So the dummy convoy is the one that's promoted and advertised. And so, you know, the roads are closed and there's a police escort, yada, yada, yada. People think it's the real president or the real king. And so if there was somebody who wanted to attack, that's who they would attack because that's who they thought it was. But it's a decoy. It's a dummy. It's a distraction. The real king, the real president is traveling more discreetly in a second convoy somewhere else going in a totally different direction. So it was thought that this uh, this second ark was more like a decoy, a dummy ark. So if this one was taken, this was stolen or what have you uh, in a defeat, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Now, there are uh, a tribe called the Limba tribe uh, in Africa. And this Limba tribe has what is called the Cohen gene. It is a gene that distinguishes them as Levites. So they are actually a part of Israel. What are they doing in Africa? It is believed that when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon, that as Solomon was giving gifts to Sheba, he gave Sheba this secondary ark because the Limba to this day claim that they have the Ark of the Covenant. Why would they lie? Do they have the Ark of the Covenant? Maybe they do, but maybe they have the secondary ark. Maybe they have the dummy ark, the decoy ark, the litter, if you will. So what had happened is when, uh, the, as the legend goes, as the belief goes, when Solomon was giving gifts to Sheba and sent her away, that he gave her this secondary ark and along with it a contingent of Levites so that they could teach Queen Sheba the entire Torah. And they could lead this people into Torah obedience. And so that's why we have Levites that are black that are living in Africa in this Limba tribe. So that, that is one of, uh, another one of the theories. It is also believed that the secondary ark carried the original tablets of the Ten Commandments. Because if you really think about it, the Ark of the Covenant, the legitimate real Ark of the Covenant, had the secondary tablets. Why? What happened to the first tablets? If you remember Moses come down from Sinai, seeing the people, uh, the children of Israel participating in worship of the golden calf, he got angry and threw down the tablets and smashed them. They were said to be of made of pure sapphire, sapphire tablets. They were broken. Well, even though they were broken, they were still forged by God's hand. They were still holy. So they took the, the broken pieces of this sapphire uh, set of tablets of the Ten Commandments and put it in the dummy ark, put it in the secondary ark. And the second set of tablets that Moses had to uh, uh, bring out of the rocket himself, and God wrote the Ten Commandments by his finger on those secondary tablets, that is what was placed in the Ark of the Covenant as we know it, the one that, that occupied the tabernacle. Now, it also is said and believed that the tabernacle, as I said, housed the legitimate real Ark of the Covenant, but there was also a tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting was Moses' special tent uh, as opposed and differentiated from the tabernacle itself. And that is also where the dummy ark was placed or the secondary ark was placed. Uh, that is what some people and what some theories hold and, and say. Now, again, I'm just giving you this theory and this option. I'm 
personally not sure where I land on this, but I just thought it was a tantalizing tidbit of information that I thought you'd be interested in and wanted to share. Now, again, this is I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, and this is not a hill that I'm going to die on, but do I believe that there is a possibility of a secondary ark? Sure, especially because the Limba claim that they have the Ark of the Covenant, which would be the secondary ark. Now, where is the real Ark of the Covenant? There's the big kicker and the big question and the big mystery. Nobody knows. But according to Ron Wyatt, the late Ron Wyatt, who is a biblical archaeologist, he believes, and he believes he had evidence, that the Ark of the Covenant was under Mount Calvary. Was See, what they believe is that when the temple was built, because Solomon uh, was married to an Egyptian princess, he was privy to all the technology of Egypt. And so the two columns that were in front of the temple uh, were named Joktan and Boaz, which represents strength or what have you, that these were actually columns that held sand. And it was part of, men, of a mechanism of a sand hydraulic uh, system that created a false floor in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And whenever there was a threat of the temple being ransacked, that the holy furnishings were put in the holy of holies the sand hydraulic system would be triggered and the floor would be lowered to a cave system and the furnishings would be whisked away to a safe place now it's interesting that in one measurement the capitals on the the uh the pillars of the temple are one measurement and in another passage it's a totally contradictory different measurement is there a contradiction there? No, one was the measurement before the sand hydraulic was triggered. The second measurement was after the sand hydraulic was triggered. That's what's believed and said. So these, these furnishings were whisked away uh, through a cave system under Mount Calvary, under Golgotha. And when the earthquake took place and it split the rocks, that the blood of Yeshua on the cross dripped down into this crack and made it made its way down to the cavern that the Ark of the Covenant was being held, and Yeshua's atoning blood was was splashed and dripped on the mercy seat. That's what is believed, and that's what has been reported by John uh, by Ron Wyatt and and other biblical archaeologists. Again, do I know this to be true or factual? I don't know. I tend to believe that, but even if that's not where the Ark of the Covenant is. At the present moment, I do believe that the Levitical priests that are being trained right now, even though there's no temple built, there's something called the Temple Institute. And there's been priests that have been selected. They have the garments. They have all the furnishings minus the Ark of the Covenant. And they've already been practicing the customs and rituals and sacrifices to prepare when the temple is rebuilt. So, you know, for it to be a fully functioning temple, you have to have the Ark of the Covenant. I believe they know where it is. Of course, they're not telling anybody. And on the pains of death, they won't tell anybody. Just like on the pains of death, they won't reveal what the true pronunciation of yud heh vav -Hey, God's name is. So that is the uh, secrets of Behelotecha. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Shalom and God bless.